John chapter 14. You guys are always a rowdy bunch, and I love it. I do. I like rowdy people. I like noisy people. I like noise in the church, don't you? I do. I remember when I first came to church, it was like, shh. It's hard to be quiet, isn't it? Ladies, it's hard to be quiet. <laughs> Ladies first and then the guys. In John chapter 14, I think that Jesus, in my estimation, gave the most profound words to us that he ever has. More than that he would save us. More than that we would go to heaven. More profound than that we'll spend eternity with God and that everything's forgiven and our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. More profound than that are the words that Jesus shared in John chapter 14 and verse 12. Read with me. Most assuredly, I say to you, when he says that, the word is amen. So let it be. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me. Now look this way. How many of you by a raise of the hand believe in Jesus? Okay, you just accused yourself. You just said you believe in Jesus. It says, for those who believe in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father in heaven. Greater works. Can you honestly say that what you're doing today is equal to what Jesus was doing, and can we say that it's greater than what Jesus did. And yet he told us if we believed in him that we would do what he did but we would do greater than what he did. Can we honestly say today as a church that we are doing as a body of believers, as a lot of people, are we doing greater than what Jesus has done? And if we're not, we need to consider what must we then do. Join me in prayer. Father, I thank you today for the honor to, pre to preach your word, for the privilege to be one of your children, for the joy that it is to enjoy my salvation, to be among this group of people today. I ask you today, Father, as I begin the process of laying out what we'll be doing in 2014, that you would open our minds and our hearts to receive from your word and by your spirit who we are, what we are, what we're supposed to be doing and the greater things that we have opportunity to do. Lord, may you be glorified today in this message. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to ask you a question. I really do want to ask you a question. Are you willing to partner with us to do a greater work than we've ever done? Because in order to do a greater work, we have to do greater things. We have to take greater risks. We have to do all kinds of stuff. And I want to put a seed thought in your head from the very beginning of this message this morning. When you look across Wilmington, in comparison to, say, other cities in North Carolina... So let's just stay local to North Carolina. I want you to think about Wilmington in comparison to other cities, Charlotte, Raleigh, Asheville, some of the larger cities, Winston-Salem. I want you to consider this for a second. When you think about Wilmington and you think about anything, I don't care what it is, anything in Wilmington, what in Wilmington would we say is awesome? That is not natural that the people of Wilmington have decided that what we create what we build what we do this is going to be awesome in comparison to other cities and I want you to think about the fact that um, one restaurant that I think is awesome is P.F. Chang's you thought I was going to say Taco Bell, didn't you? No, no. Taco Bell's not awesome. It's cheap. 
But P.F. Chang's is an awesome restaurant. They have some amazing desserts and stuff like that. But, you know, we don't have one in Wilmington because they haven't decided whether Wilmington can support that or not, and there's not a lot of stuff there. Whenever it comes to a sporting team in Wilmington, do people just... Do you have a hard time when the Seahawks are playing basketball or baseball or something? Do you have a hard time uh, getting that through uh, 132 or it's not a problem at all? No, no real traffic issues at all. You know, one thing, I want you to think about this. Whenever I'm, sometimes whenever I'm going through Raleigh and that area and there's a game going on, you know one of the things that I see on the roads? I see these cars coming down and there's flags hanging out of their windows and they're, they got flags that are NC State or Duke or Carolina or something like that. You ever seen those cars? And they got people and their faces are painted and all that kind of stuff. I ask myself this question. When did I ever see a Seahawk flag riding through Wilmington and the college is here? That's a good question. That's a great observation. I, I'm not downing our school. I'm just saying we have not made a commitment to have an awesome team. When it comes to restaurants, we don't have any awesome restaurants in Wilmington. When it comes to churches, we don't have any awesome churches in Wilmington. We have some big churches. We have some churches that do quite a bit of stuff. Including Northside, we don't have an awesome That when somebody walks in the back door like, I don't know who their God is, but I got to tell you something. To them, he is awesome. What they say that their God has done, they live out in their life, and it is awesome what they do. What in Wilmington is awesome? And I'll tell you why there's nothing in Wilmington that's awesome. It is because the people of Wilmington don't want anything awesome. They want something mediocre, even, level, average. Because we can't stomach awesome. We would never build a football stadium here. No, that'd be too expensive. Can't do that. We couldn't build a baseball stadium here because it would be tax expensive. And I sort of agree with that one, by the way. I mean, if you're going to build one, it should be privately funded. But nonetheless, look at the controversy that comes up whenever any, anything, anything at all comes up that would, might possibly... Do something awesome in a city. Look how quickly we turn away from it. And how bothered we are by it. And yet Jesus said, I want you to sign up for something greater. When I walked by and you were living your life and I tapped you on the shoulder and saved you, I signed you up for something greater than what you were doing. The works that I'm doing that you guys think are awesome, you don't even know what that is because when I saved you, I signed you up for something greater than what I'm doing. Something greater. Are we ready to take on something greater in the area? Here, I am. About a year ago, maybe a little more than a year ago, about a year ago, at the prompting of the Lord, I started leading this church towards a greater vision. Now, whether you think it is or not, is immaterial. It's a greater vision than God has ever given me before. And I began to prepare our staff for this greater vision. I began to see that there had been a monumental shift in our situation in our country that had taken place several years earlier. And rather than being prepared for this shift, I found that we were seriously behind in the ability to navigate the waters of a brand new reality that was going on in this country. Our society that had once aligned with and also supported the, what I would consider the moral lifestyle and you could say Christian lifestyle and the cultural norms of our faith began to deteriorate. Respect for authority, honor for parents, marriage, life, church, God, patriotism, a right understanding of a moral human sexuality, all began to go out the window and began to change in radical ways. We are in what I would call a, a, a culture where sin has been normalized, and I mean sin of every type 
is normalized. There is no unusual sin. There is no bad sin. There is nothing that we shouldn't reach for that would even be considered perverse or wrong. We're in a sin-normalized society, and it has happened in the last five years, more than it ever has in any time in the history of our country. Individuals and families who were once aided in their lives by our country and the communities that we've chosen to live in are now being isolated and labeled as radical haters and in need of eradication from this country. The governor of New York shared last week that he wanted, really desired that anybody who believed in God, anybody who believed in morality, anybody that couldn't ex embrace some of the more um, alternative styles of life that are out there, he would prefer that they left the state and get out of the state. And that's, you know, he has the ability to say that, and I'm not sure if he has right, but he has an ability to say that. But that just identifies uh, kind of the, the shift that we have seen in our society. Our culture and our society now is basically hostile to most of the things that are Christian. Not everything, but for most of the things, they're hostile to that. During the course of my lifetime, I can't speak for anybody else's, but during the course of my lifetime, I don't know that I have seen a more difficult time to raise a family, to parent your children, to make a living, or especially to take a stand for Jesus. I don't know that I've ever seen it more difficult than I do now. And what we once did worked very well for what we once were. But what we presently do is not very effective for what we have become as a nation. We're not being radically effective. Our yards now have become fenced-in fortresses. Our workspace has become barricaded cubicles. Our social gatherings have turned into social media. We would rather tweet you than talk to you. We would rather text you than call you. We would rather surf the internet than surf the waves at the beach. We've lost our social connection. In short, we've lost our connection with God. We've lost our connection with one another. And clearly, we have lost our connection even with ourselves. We don't really know who we are anymore. It's a challenge. Our home life is different. We almost need multiple lives now in order to handle the multiple situations that we're in. We need multiple personalities for multiple lives. Whether it's a home life, a work life, a church life, a social life, a sporting life, a private life, a public life, a secret life, whatever it happens to be, we feel that we have to be different people in every one of these scenarios and situations. Because we have so many broken relationships now that are unmended and we refuse to mend them, our families cannot celebrate one Christmas, one Thanksgiving, one Easter, one birthday, one anniversary. We don't have to celebrate those things on multiple platforms and with multiple people. And when we celebrate it here, of course, we can't talk about the people that we just celebrated it with over here because there's such anger or despise or hatred or something like that for what's going on. And so we don't have the ability anymore to live this one life that God intended for us to live. And if everyone in those lives, we have to be somebody different. We cannot legally speak about Jesus in public. I can't pray at a meeting and talk about Jesus. I can't talk to my coworker about Jesus. I can't speak to anybody about Jesus, so I have to hide and in secret have my own secret faith, secret fears, uh, secret uh, dreams and hopes, and all that has to stay separate. So our lives are lived in schizophrenia. We're unsure how we're supposed to act in any one given situation. Our life has changed, and it's time to reconnect. But how do we reconnect? I think that the church of Jesus Christ is God's answer to what this world desperately needs because we are the representation of Jesus Christ, and they need Jesus. I've already shared that with you. But it's our responsibility to represent Jesus to this world. And so the church, though, has to reconnect to something as well, and that is reality. Our world has greatly changed. It has not changed. It has greatly changed. It has radically changed in the last several years. And we have to change to meet the greater challenges of this brand new reality that we're living in right now. There's a young girl in Australia. She's a teenager, lost, very few friends, 
uh, disconnected. And in Australia, it's, it's, uh, it can, you can get kind of spread out. You can get kind of distance from each other. And so this girl is looking for a relationship. She's looking for acceptance. She's looking for understanding. So she hears about a church that is there and a youth group that is there in Australia called Young and Free, a ministry of Hillsong Church in Australia. And she hears that there's the potential that she could be accepted into this church. No matter what she's done, no matter where she's been, no matter who she presently is, no matter what she looks like, no matter what her challenge is, that they would accept that. At least that's what they say, but probably like many other times, we've all heard that we'll be accepted only to be rejected once we get there. But she's willing to try. She's willing to at least go see what would happen. So she goes into this church, into their student ministry, and as she goes into the student ministry, she is immediately embraced, but she goes beyond an embrace. She's embraced, she's ministered to, She's discipled until she comes to faith in Jesus Christ. She gives the testimony that what was so incredible was that the people seemed to care for her more than they cared for their structure, more than they cared for their program, more than they cared for their time. They genuinely cared for her. They, they believed in her no matter where she was at. Their lives didn't get in the way of how they could maybe minister to her life. They really cared. She was saved. She was so blown away by the love of Jesus and the love of the people of God that she began to tell her friends at school. Now, her friends at school are not, quote, unquote, uh, well-painted up church people. They were just people, young people, with the same challenges that we face, that our young people face, real challenges. You know that church people don't like to address but real stuff that goes on in kids' lives. And she started bringing them to church and she started sharing and she noticed that suddenly her friends started to come to faith in Christ. And she had so many people coming to faith in Christ that she made this statement. She said, you know, the neat part about this is that my church life and my school life have become one life. And she said, it's so amazing to be able to be who I am no matter where I go. And that's what God has led me to do here is to help all of you take your church life, your school life, your work life, your private life, your financial life, your sexual life, your marital life, and make it one life. Jesus said that if you would be ashamed of me before men, I would be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. He says, I don't want you to have a personal, private life where you love me and a public life where you don't. I want your life with me to be the same life, whether it's in private or whether it's in public or what's real. It seems that the people of God are very challenged because when we come here, we live a very different life in this church. You guys got up this morning, you dressed and you cleaned up and you looked nice. And you put on your smiles and you came to church and everything's okay. Because there's not one of you in here that has a single issue or a single problem. Uh, you're all financially stable. Uh, your relationships are completely intact. There's no anger. There's no malice. There's no unforgiveness. You guys are perfect. And we know that because when you come to church, that's what we're supposed to portray. And so we live a different life at church than we live somewhere else. And that's one of the reasons that the world calls us hypocrites because, see, in church, it is not in vogue to be real. As if we don't all have feelings. As if there's not something about us that we love Jesus for because he knows us just like we are. You, you, do you ever know this about me? There's days that I really don't want to come preach here. There's every now and again, I just would rather lay in bed and sleep. Not even come. Because I know that there's going to be a cost to everything that I say. I know that tomorrow I'm going to have emails. I know that I'm going to have phone calls. I know that I'm going to have agreements. I know that I'm going to have disagreements. But if I never, you know what the interesting thing is when I'm on vacation, that following Monday, none of those things exist. And sometimes like, I just don't even feel like going and sharing this, Lord, because you know that I'm going to get attacked and you know that I'm going to get encouraged. And those two things make me schizophrenic. 
to, to one person says, oh my goodness, pastor, I was saved gloriously by Jesus Christ today. It is amazing. You are the most great preacher I've ever heard in my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Continue, continue, continue. While another person says, that was the most pagan thing you have ever said. And I just feel like, you know what, I'm not doing it today. I found out I was a criminal this week. You ever found out that you're a criminal and you didn't know it? I walked into my house and my wife and my daughter-in-law have this grin and giggle on their face like something funny went on. And, and I, I'm like, what? She said, have something for you on the table. I'm like, What's on the table? Go look. Go look. So I go over to the table. I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't have different lives. I do live one life before I'm the same everywhere I go. So I pick up this thing and, and there's a, a picture of my car going through a red light. And I'm thinking, what? I'm not going through no red light. Now here's how it works. There are three photos on this thing. One photo is your car before you cross into the intersection. One photo is of you in the middle of the intersection. And one photo is a zoomed in close up of your license plate so that they know, you know that's your car. And it also gives you the time stamp of when it was and all this stuff. So I'm thinking, I didn't run a red light, but there's the evidence. And I had to go back and be reminded I had gone to, it was at 17th Street in Dawson. And, uh, you know, it, it, the thing is, I know that there's a traffic light camera there because it's okay to run red lights through the words. There's no traffic light camera, but where there is one, you got to be careful. You understand what I'm saying. So I'm like, gosh, I remember, when was I over there? And I had gone to get my teeth cleaned. And I remember I got a phone call. And, and it was a, a person who was quite hysterical. And so I'm dealing with him on the phone, and I just never looked up. So you know what I should do? I should escape my responsibility, see if I can call up some people, get a favor pulled so I can get rid of the ticket, right? No, I did it. I did it. Whether I remember doing it or not is immaterial. I could have killed somebody. They could have killed me. That's a lesson to say, man, you need to pay attention whenever you're on the phone. And the thing was, I don't, I don't really hold my phone. I've got this thing in my car where you, just, you can talk. I'm talking on the phone, and I'm apparently not paying any attention, so I get this ticket. I found out I'm a criminal. So I didn't feel good that day because I was like, daggone it. I've, I try not to do that. And, and so I wasn't in a good mood for the rest of the day, not because of the $50 ticket. That's not a big deal. But it's like, I try so hard, and then I felt bad about that. Did you know that Terry and I argue from time to time? Did you know that there are times that I flat hate her guts? I'm being honest with you guys. There is nobody that I can hate more than my wife. Because I'm telling you that the depth of love also measures the depth of hatred. And because my love for her is so deep, she can make me madder than any person on the face of this planet. There are times in our life that we walk around in dead silence. As a Christian pastor, that's a reality in my life sometimes. There are times that I pout. There are times that she pouts. There are times that we get mad at each other. There are times whenever we wake up and nothing has happened. And the first words out of my mouth set the course of the day. And it's bad even though Jesus is my Savior. That just happens to be real. There have been times in my life whenever I was broke. There was times when I had plenty and somebody took the plenty that I had. That's just real. There are times whenever there's some of you that I don't like too well, and there are times that some of you don't like me too well, and that's just real. There are times when everything doesn't work out. There are times I get mad at God because he made it too cold outside, or he made it too hot outside, or he made it rain whenever he knew good and well that I had something that didn't need to be done in the rain. There are times that some of you do outside work and you're praying to God, please don't let it rain or I'm going to starve this week because if I don't work, I don't get to eat and it rains all week long. And you get mad. That's just real. There are times that you don't want to be at church. There are some people that keep our nursery that they keep it all four hours because nobody else will keep them and they do it because they love Jesus but they're aggravated the whole time they're doing it and with good reason. And that's just real. Last year when our staff was worn out and tired and I came before you and I said, listen, I'm just going to be honest with you guys because I'm not living three or four different lives. I'm going to live one and tell you that we're tired, we're beat up, and we're worn out. And if we don't take a break, we're not going to make it. 
And as much as I know this is a difficult challenge, we're going to take this last week off because we needed a break. And it did immeasurable things for us. And we got, you know, pressed back and forth both ways. But I just wanted to tell you the truth because sometimes I wouldn't tell you if we were tired if we weren't tired. You ever get tired in the work? You ever get tired of the work? You know, Christians are like, well, you know, we get tired in the work. But we never get tired of the work. Oh, I get tired of the work. (laughs) I get tired of the work. Because that's real. That's real. That's real. You ever heard a preacher say, well, I made me so mad, make a preacher cuss. Now Now, we didn't cuss. But I'll write it on a piece of paper and sign it. No, the truth is you cussed. That's the truth. The truth is that Christians get drunk. Christians are on drugs. Christians are fornicating. Christians are committing adultery. Christians are in financial distress. Christians are going bankrupt. Christians are fighting. Christians murder people. Christians are are challenged in marriages. Christian kids are all over the place. That's the truth. That's the truth. And where are they supposed to get their answers? But in the house of God. But in the house of God, we're so afraid to say anything because it would sound non-Christian. That this is just a place full of hypocrites, whitewashed sepulchers, painted on the outside and inside full of dead men's bones. I want to do something more awesome than that. I want to do something greater than that and be real for a change. Jesus said, the work that I do, you would do. And greater works than these that you would do. If we're ever going to help anybody live one life, then we're going to have to learn in our own life how to navigate through life. And in navigating through life, there's a series of relationships that we have to learn to recognize what they are and be able to shift from one relationship to another to be able to handle the challenges that are out there in the world. Not only do we have to do it as an individual, but we also have to do it as a church if we're ever going to make it. And I want to take the next several weeks and I want to try to help you understand this greater vision that God is leading me to do here. We've been working on it for better than a year and many of you are like, I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand what they're doing. They're changing a lot of stuff and it's beginning to bother me or or I don't know. So I'm getting ready to tell you what this is all about. But I want you to understand from the very beginning here, if we're ever going to live one life then God has to be at the center of that life. Because as as God is at the center of all of our lives and every part of our life, and we all migrate towards God, we will all come together in this one life. We've become disconnected. Disconnected from God. We've become disconnected to one another. And certainly God is being ushered out of the public arena, and it's our responsibility to carry him back out there and to reconnect him to the world in which we live. But to do that, we're going to have to make relationships. And in those relationships, I want to give you five relationships this morning that we need to understand if we're going to accurately and adequately make a way in this world. So let me give them to you. The first relationship is a divine relationship. And this is what this sanctuary is all about, is entering into a divine relationship with the Lord. In the Gospel of Mark... Jesus was trying to help his disciples understand something about forgiveness. And it was a challenging situation. And he made this comment that in this arena that he was talking about, he says, with men, these things are impossible. But not with God. With God, all things are possible. Contained in that verse of scripture is a major truth. And that major truth is that when you come in here, you need to understand that I am limited in possibility. I am not a person who can climb over everything in the world, but I have limitations to my abilities. But God doesn't. So you need a relationship with the God of heaven to do those things which are not possible with men. That's a divine relationship. Every one of us needs to be connected to God because if we are not, then we will only ever live in the realm of humanity. We will never live in the realm of divinity. We'll never live in the realm of the impossible. We'll never live in the realm of the miraculous. There's there's no need for you to pray for healing from me because I can't heal you. 
I can pray for your healing, but I am not the healer. He is. And if you're ever going to need healing, you're going to talk to him. If you ever need direction, you're going to have to talk to him. If you ever need gifts, you're going to have to talk to him. We've got to be connected to God and understand that only with God are all things possible, but not with men. One of the great challenges of that is that sometimes men, pastors or priests or whatever, try to engage in divine activity which belongs only to God. There's places where they'll tell you when you come in, hey, don't worry, I'm absolving your sin. I'm letting you know this morning, all of your sins are absolved. The Bible teaches me who can forgive sin but God only? Nobody. Only God forgives sin. I don't care how many times I tell you I'm letting your sin go. That means nothing. You've got to have a relationship with God because it is him and him alone who forgives sin. So don't expect divine activity from me because you're not going to get it. So we've got to understand that part of, our, part of our attempts and accomplishments here are to connect you with God. And that's what this arena is right here. I'll speak about that next Sunday, about how we want to connect you up with the Lord. A second relationship, though, is a human relationship. This relationship, the, the divine relationship, is between God and man. The human relationship is man to man. And when I say man to man, I'm talking about lost person to lost person. There's no Christianity in here whatsoever. It's a man to man relationship. And this relationship dynamic is very different. Very, very different than any other relationship. Let me read a passage of scripture to you that will explain this. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Here's some things we need to understand. Paul told Timothy, he said this. We know that the law is good. If, there's a big if, if... One uses it lawfully. Now, how do you use it lawfully? You need to know something. He says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person. Can I pause there for a second? When you got saved, what did you become? A righteous person. For he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So you might not act righteous, but he made you righteous in Christ. And we need to learn that. He said, knowing this, that the law is not for a righteous person. Who's it for? It says, but for the lawless and the insubordinate, for the ungodly and the sinner, for the unholy and the profane, for the murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, fornicators, sodomites, kidnappers, liars, perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to doctrine, it is for them. In other words, the law was given for the lost. And it was given for the lost for several reasons. One of those reasons is to identify their need for Jesus. Another reason was so that they could actually function. You have to realize that, I want you to think about this in a lost arena. Let me put you in your place of business that is not a Christian organization, but let's say it's Corning or GE or Walmart or Target or where, somewhere like that. And I want you to realize that in that arena... God's already been pushed out. You can't talk about him there. So this is a very secular arena or a lost arena. Why do they need law there? In those areas, they've got to have parameters, procedures, employee manuals, time off opportunities, what you can do, what you can't do. We've got to make sure that there are laws that say, hey, uh, if you are a heterosexual and you're working with a homosexual that you can't say anything about that or deal anything without that if you're a white person working with a black person or if you're a Chinese man working with an Indian that you can't recognize their race you can't say anything about that that if you're a man working with a woman or a woman working with a man that you can't say anything about that they've got to set all these parameters out there so that people that don't know each other don't want to know each other don't like each other don't agree with each other have the ability to work with each other so that they can actually produce something that would be awesome to the world and it requires law and they keep making more and more and more and more laws as we keep changing more and more and more for the purpose of making sure that we can together though we disagree accomplish something together that is the defined purpose of the business for which we're working that's why we have law and we have to have that law among people who do not have the Spirit of God within them because they don't naturally do the things that those who are filled with the Spirit of God would naturally do. So we have to have these things here. 
And what do we want as Christians? We want the world to be able to do the things that we do and live like we do apart from the Spirit, and that's not real. That is not real. So when we look out into the world, we have this understanding that there's a reason that they set laws out there. There's a reason that they have to have this stuff down. There's a reason that they have all of this, hey, uh, you, you can't discriminate against all these different things. There's a reason for it. Whether we like it or not, there is a reason for it. Therefore, when we enter into a relationship, when it's human to human, man to man, there's going to be rules and regulations. Why do you think that when you live in a neighborhood that they have these neighborhood covenants and rules? Because somebody might not like the way you live. Somebody might not like the fact that you want to put a car out in your front yard and put it up under center blocks and just take the wheels off and let it sit in the front yard. They might not like that. So we have homeowners associations of people who have chosen to live beside you, albeit they don't like you. And they don't agree with you. So we set up a set of rules and laws so that together we can kind of agree that, hey, you don't do this and I won't do that and we'll kind of live all right with one another. That's what it means to be in a man-to-man -man relationship. And we have to know what that's like. Thirdly, there is a spiritual relationship and that is between Christian to Christian. That means now that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And as a result of that, we don't need law. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there shall be liberty. So we don't need law. That's because I'm going to respect you because I have the Spirit of Christ. You're going to respect me because you have the Spirit of Christ. There's some other things going on. Let me tell you how we sort of mess up on this whole issue of spirituality. Let me read you a passage of Scripture to start with. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that, here's why, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Pause for a moment. Why did God give us the spirit of God? So that there's something that we would know. What do we need to know? God has given us some stuff. He's given us some stuff freely. We don't know what it is. So God gives us the Spirit of God so we'll know what this stuff is. Stuff. Stuff. Not actions, stuff. So that we freely know the things that God has given to us. He goes on to say this, These things we also speak about, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, and we are going to compare spiritual things with spiritual things. In other words, we're not going to make comparisons on a human lost level with spiritual things. Boy, if you start doing that, you're going to be everybody's judge. To say, well, we ought to act like this, but they act like this. That's not a fair assessment. Because you're comparing something spiritual with something that's secular, something that's satanic, something that's wrong, something that's sinful, something that's about lostness. Let me give you an example of what I mean. When we do spiritual gifts inventories here, sometimes somebody having a gift inventory that is administration. Well, if a person has the gift of administration, what's the first thing we want to do with them? Do we want to do something spiritual? We want to do something just natural, something regular. We'll say, well, I'll tell you what, I'll bet you those folks could probably organize an office. They're probably good with math. Maybe they'd be a good accountant or something like that. Uh, these people could run a part of a ministry because they'll have it completely organized. And that's what we do. We take spiritual gifts and we apply them to fleshly things. Not that it won't make those fleshly things better. I'm not saying that because it will. But why do you suppose that God would give us the gift of administration in the spiritual realm? You think it's so to keep your desk neat? I mean, do we really lower it down that low so we keep our desk neat? Is that why it would be? You ever thought that maybe sometimes God gives a spirit of administration so that that person with administration can keep spiritual things in order and can have the authority from the Spirit of God to remind us when spiritual things need to be in order? You remember in the context of this whole speech was 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14 on speaking in tongues. And the apostle Paul says, I want you to know something. I wish that I, you know, I speak in tongues more than all of you. But let me tell you something. There are other things that are far more important than that. And let me put them in spiritual order for you. And I'm going to put this one all the way at the bottom. So that you understand that there is a spiritual order. 
And we need people with organizational skills in the spirit to say, hey, it's not about keeping the desk straight. It's about keeping our faith straight. It's about understanding that God has spiritual priorities that are out there. And not only that, but listen to me. Whenever we enter into a spiritual realm, which hopefully is all of us that are in here, God says there's stuff that God has given to you and me that the world doesn't have. Do you realize that whenever somebody dies in the world, they don't have a clue what went on? They don't know if there's nothing. They don't know if there's something. They don't know. They don't have a clue. Guess what? You and I know. We know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So whenever I do a funeral service and I say, hey, this, I remember there was a guy named Jimmy Lane that was a member of our church. Jimmy was a very uh, energetic guy, a gracious guy. He gave me a car. To, he gave a car to this church for us to sell that we might be able to raise money for a, a campaign that we were doing. Just an amazing guy. I love Jimmy. And one day he was working on a track hoe and he jumped off the track hoe and he died in the middle of the air of a massive heart attack before his feet hit the ground because there was some a friend of his was down there and and was going to catch him because he stepped out and said something's wrong and he jumped and died in the middle of the air and at his funeral service here's what I said I want you to imagine this Jimmy stepped off the track hoe and landed his feet landed in heaven what an amazing thought and it's not a thought it's a reality and the only people that can talk about that are spiritual people. The only people that can talk about the rapture of the church are spiritual people. The only people that can talk about when the lion lays with the lamb and we're all happy and there's no sin and there's peace everywhere are spiritual people. And we get to get together and talk about these awesome spiritual things. We get together to get to talk about the fact that God has given this person over here a gift that I don't have. Hey, how, how's that working out in, the, in life? Are you using it the way you're supposed to? So when spiritual people come together in a spiritual relationship, we have an opportunity to enter into conversation that you're not going to get anywhere else. Anywhere else. Anywhere else. When we talk about, well, there's a church over there and there's a church over here, that's a secular conversation. A spiritual conversation is there is one Lord, one faith, one God, one baptism, one body, one head. That's what it's all about. So all these churches in Wilmington are my church. And they're your church, and we should not be in competition with anybody, but in cooperation with everybody. That's a spiritual conversation. The other stuff is secular. We've got to understand there's a spiritual realm. Fourthly, there's a redemptive relationship that we have to understand. And that is that that's between a Christian and a lost person. In this redemptive conversation, listen to what Paul wrote Concerning this one, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he said this. Here's something we need to understand. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. Why? Because they are foolishness to him. He didn't say they just didn't receive them. He said they're foolishness. In other words, when we start talking about spiritual things, they think we're stupid. Right? Isn't that what they're saying about us? That we're dumb, ignorant, moronic people? That's what they're supposed to say. It's foolishness to them, the things that we say. But it says this, it goes on to say, he cannot know them, nor can he know them. There's no capacity for a lost man to know the things that we're talking about because they are spiritually discerned and they do not have the spirit. So why in the world do you ever expect a lost person to know what we're talking about? We have to understand that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul said this, If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose mind the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. So in all of our stuff, if we ever do anything, because we want so much of our own way here, but if, if we get our way, guess what we're doing? We are shielding the true gospel of Jesus Christ to the people who desperately need it. Who really need it? And, in, and so many things that we do for our personal way, we're shielding off what God has asked us to give to somebody else. 1 Corinthians 5, it says this, Paul said, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with the sexually immoral people, yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of the world or with the covetous or the extortioners or idolaters since then you would have need to go out of the world. I saw you hanging out with a sinner. That's what God wanted us to do, was hang out with sinners so that we could let them know who Jesus was. 
But man, I'm telling you what, today, if you see anybody hanging out with a sinner, it's like, oh, they done backslid. No, they didn't backslid. They jumped forward. You backslid because you don't ever hang out with a sinner. You don't ever let them know who Jesus is. We've got to understand in the redemptive relationship, the Christian is the one that's got to carry all the burden and recognize they don't understand a blessed thing that we're talking about. They know nothing about morality, nothing about salvation, nothing about redemption, nothing about forgiveness, nothing about true value. They don't know anything. And it's my job to genuinely and gently share with them so that they can be saved. That's what's important. Poor old Jesus, he went and he hung out with some tax collectors and sinners. And he got criticized for it. A prostitute came to him and said, uh, she's, she's bowing down. These guys got rocks in their hands. And Jesus said, if anybody don't have any sin, you throw the first rock. And he turns to the lady and says, where are your accusers? To which she says, I don't see them, Lord. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Where is that type of mentality among the people of God? Because we don't understand a redemptive relationship. And finally, the last one is a mature relationship. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul reminded us. He says, if anyone is, if, 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 brethren, if anyone is overtaken in a weakness, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. In other words, whenever you have a brother who has fallen right in the midst of the church, Right in the midst of life, they're committing adultery, they're committing fornication, they've gone back to drink, they're back on drugs. They're, they're challenged in that way. God says, hey, they've fallen, and here's what they need. They don't need the immature judgment, which is the typical way that young people do. And I'm talking about young people in Christ. You can be 70 and young in the Lord. That our first thought is to judge, Romans chapter 14. Immature people judge, mature people despise. And he said, what you need to do is gently restore. Gently restore. Now, here's the challenge of the church today. Since we don't understand the dynamics of these relationships, we can't shift through these relationships. I can be in this service right here and walk in, and I can begin to praise the Lord. And somebody's going to say, well, he walked right past me. He, he, he didn't even talk to me. He didn't even wave at me. I'm never coming back here again because he didn't even wave at me. Hey, listen. You didn't see me shift into divine mode, did you? (laughs) When I walk through the doors back there, I shift into divine mode. I'm not looking at the ceiling. I'm looking at God. I'm not lifting my hands for show. I'm lifting my hands in praise because he deserves that. And I'm not really thinking about any of you whenever I'm in here. I'm not like, well, they need to see me raise my hand. I wonder if this is a good aim. It's not like that. I've shifted into divine mode to say, man, my God deserves my worship and I need him to do miraculous things in my life. So I'm shifting into divine mode when I come in here. When I leave here and I go into our Sunday school or if I go into a small group, I've had that opportunity, I shift into spiritual mode. And in that spiritual mode, now I'm connected back and forth and I want to say, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. And let's talk about spiritual things. And let's talk about the Lord. And let's learn some things from God. And we're going to connect to one another. And that's going to be awesome. And I can shift to that mode where I'm talking all things Jesus, all things scripture, all things spiritual, all things doctrinal. And I love doing that. But then a lost person walks up to me. And guess what? I shut down the theological conversation. And I begin to understand who they are and what challenges they're going through. I don't care what they look like. I don't care where they're at. And I shifted immediately over to a redemptive relationship with somebody. But the spiritual person that was standing beside me, who I was having a spiritual conversation with, when I shifted over to a redemptive conversation and quit talking about sin and God and all that kind of stuff and started to understand them, looks at me and says, Man, you're crazy. You just talked about righteousness and holiness and preached in the sanctuary. Here's a person that's one of the greatest sinners you've ever seen, and you turned around and acted nice to them. It's because you didn't see the shift. And then somebody walks into the church who has had all manner of sinfulness in their life. They've been gloriously saved by Jesus and they've turned their back on him for various reasons and they've got so much history behind them that we're like, I can't even believe they'd show their face in here and the person who treated them the best was the pastor and I thought he was a man of God. You didn't see me slide on that velvet glove, did you? 
You didn't know what was going on. And I'm telling you, we have to learn to be able to shift in between all of those relationships all day long. I might get another red light ticket. If I'm ever driving and I'm in divine mode. I turn on K-Love, and I love K-Love. Yesterday, I was laying in my bed, and I was listening to it for about an hour. And I listened to those words to the songs of these young people talking about how much they love God. And I just listened to the lyrics, and it so blessed my soul to hear the the thoughts, and it, and it just took me away into worship. And I'm riding down the road in my car. Sometimes I'll just be singing and raising my hand in the car. And then I kind of wake up, and I look, I'm like, and you look to the left or to the right, and people are like, what a freak. I'm like, oh, hey. <laughs> What's up? And I come to church, and somebody tells me those songs are pagan. God help you. Listen to the words. I want to ask you again. Are you willing to join with us here at Northside in 2014 to do something greater than Jesus did? So that when they say, when I ask you again, hey, is there anything awesome in Wilmington? You won't say Northside's awesome because I don't want you to say that. I want you to be able to say, yeah, there's something awesome here. God is awesome. Man, I went to that north side the other day. I walked in there, and I don't know who their God is, but whomever he is, they think he's awesome. Whatever he's told them to do, they believe that's awesome. That whenever it came time to give, they gave in an awesome, I can't even believe in this, in this economy that people would give to God the way they give. He must be an awesome God. And the only way to do that is to learn how to shift from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship and be able to give them the one and only true God. And as we come in here and worship that God, and then we take people who are accustomed to worshiping that God and connect them together so that we're all worshiping God together, and we take the God that's been kicked out of the world and reconnect him back to that world so that those out there start worshiping God, then the life in here and the life over there and the life out there becomes one life and that's what we need to be about and that's what I'm pursuing this year and I will expand it over the next few weeks but I hope you'll join me in that process stand with me Father in Jesus name thank you for Jesus thank you for the wisdom that is found in scripture you have told us that there are a variety of relationships. I have only mentioned five. There's a lot more than that. And for those of us who are maturing in you and trying to walk with you, we will become more and more and more understanding as the days go by, less and less and less judgmental, more and more active, more prayerful, more worshipful. We'll still have problems. We'll still have challenges. And I would imagine that among this congregation even this day we're not perfect and there are people here who have started out with a bad day there are folks right now that are lamenting the fact that they've entered into another sexual relationship that they wish they wouldn't have but they've fallen and they fear that they'll be rejected there are some that have engaged in drug abuse and they fear that everyone would hate them for it there are some that were mad this morning whenever they left with their families there are some kids that cussed out their parents this morning probably there are some moms that feel like that they're not even worthy of being called a mom and a total failure as a parent. There are dads that work real hard but don't get paid as much as they'd like and feel like they're a bad provider. There are preachers that feel like that they're always inadequate whenever they step up to this platform. And yet in the midst of all of it, Father, you love us and you still pursue us. Help us to learn that it's okay to share all of our life in here be real 
Help our church to embrace the true reality of the changes that have happened in our society. It's never been more difficult to be a parent, to be a person, to be a boy or a girl, to be sexually pure, to get married. It's never been harder. And the church has to have the answers to those things. Let us embrace the direction you're leading us and what it's going to take. And I pray that we will find favor with you and with your people. Draw now people to yourself who need to be saved, who need prayer, whatever they need. We're here to receive them with open arms and open hearts. In Christ's name, amen. You come if you